The contrast couldn't be starker, could it? What we were doing with Jesus last week was way over here on this hand. And what we're doing with Jesus this week is way over here on this hand. Last week, Jesus was picking a fight with his relatives, and they rose to the occasion, rushing upon him to throw him over the cliff to kill him, chasing him out of their midst. This week, Jesus is picking a fight with the demons, and they're just as powerless to do him any harm. He casts them out along with everything that has to do with them, disruptions, fevers, and sicknesses of every kind. All of it, all of them, he casts out, and everyone heard about him, and they rushed upon him so that, they could do, so that he could do his business by night. But when it was day, he departed from them, even though they wanted him to stay. At least we know he's here, don't we? He is the Son of God come in the flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior, and there's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about him. He's not Joseph's boy doing any magic tricks. This is the Son of Man bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth in a thunderous introduction. Happy epiphany. Even though the contrast is clear, from his own relatives trying to kill him to the rest of the world begging him to stay with them, there is a disturbing similarity between the two. Something is the same about these two opposites, a common denominator. Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth, says Jeremiah. It takes a prophet like Jeremiah to get our minds right about some of these sentiments we have. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. Well, that sounds just dandy, doesn't it? God has a purpose for me. But Jeremiah hears the rest of the speech, which says, I appointed you a prophet to the nations. He objects immediately. I'm too young. Smart kid, that Jeremiah. At least he knows better than to sentimentalize the word of God. His stomach was probably turning inside out and upside down and flying all over his insides while the word of God was saying, before I, you were born, I consecrated you. Well, obviously, God, I'm too young. You've got the wrong kid. Get somebody else, probably somebody older. Can you imagine how Jesus felt? Everybody wants a piece of him, either to kill him or to get power from him. So he makes for a desolate place like he's Charlie Varick with a car full of money, at least to give him a few moments to catch his breath before they catch up with him. He was 12 years old, remember, just yesterday in the temple, having a grand old time debating with the old professors there in the safety of the temple, which means that Jesus was a real bookworm when he was a little boy, settling down with a, a good book and a glass of milk every night, burning the lamp oil low while his mom and dad pondered these things, treasuring them in their hearts. But it's not like he grew up to be a pencil neck geek, either. He knew how to swing a hammer and dimension up a board, which takes some real elbow grease, especially if your plane goes out of square or the iron gets dull. We also know from his parables that he was a man of the world, knowing agribusiness like the back of his hand, the wine business, urban commercial affairs, and he knew how to belly up to the bar at the pub to order a beer or a wine to get the, get the grease going on the storytelling, the storytelling gears. He was, without a doubt, a guy's guy, a man's man, everybody's favorite, just like the Bible says he was just before he got the Holy Spirit. To understand what happens to a prophet or to the Son of Man when he gets the Holy Spirit, cast your mind to that delightful science experiment where you, you wrap a wire around a nail. Now, the wire and the nail don't do anything apart from each other, and they don't do anything together either. 
Not until you hook either end of the wire up to the battery. And suddenly, you're live. An electromagnet and anything near you starts moving toward you because it's your new nature as the prophet with the power of the Holy Spirit or the Son of Man with the power. There's nothing you can do to stop it. And the first thing you do is say, I'm too young. But the Holy Spirit moved Jesus out into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days. And he came back and the demons and the sick started moving toward him because they had to, because he was charged up with the Holy Spirit. And then his relatives started moving toward him because they had to, because he was charged up. And then more demons and more sick and more needy. And after a night of it, he ran away to a desolate place. Oh, for a nice piece of wood, a hammer, a plane, and a saw. For Jeremiah, it was too late. He was right. He was too young. But that was just the way God wanted it. He wanted to confront his own people with this kid to see if they were listening to his word or whether they were comfortable in their own religion, their own tradition, their own sentimental daydream about a very nice God. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms, God says to the kid, to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and overthrow. Not a very nice God, is he? He's not going to tear down our church, is he? We're the good guys. This final prophet to the nations, the prophet of all prophets, the son of man to the nations, Jesus, the joy of man's desiring, is going from downtown to downtown, right? That's where he's live and magnetic, right? In the middle of all the malls, of all the cities. That's where the demons are, right? They were the good guys, making sure they got ready the night before. Mom's laying out the Sabbath clothes so that the kids could rise to an early quick breakfast and get ready quickly while dads grumbled about the service start times, the boring songs, and the long message. But they trundled themselves on down to the building just as the bell was ringing, getting settled in the pews just after the announcements or the opening hymn, and then there was Jesus. It was in their church buildings where the demons were. The demons were in their church buildings and he drew them right out, right when the acolyte was reading the gradual and proud mom and dad and grandma and grandpa were looking on, a demon began to shout, Ha! Ah, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebukes him saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him. Gosh, who knew Big Jimbo had an unclean demon? What's an unclean demon? I don't know. Maybe we should look that one up. In any case, no matter how many guitar amps you plug in or drum sets or light arrays or fog machines, nothing will ever top the time Jesus cast out a demon in the middle of church. Demons in church? That's not true now, is it? Those went away when Jesus cast them out. Hmm. Fevers are here now. Mental illness is here now. Cancer is here now. Sin is here now. You know... I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday, a nice guy, lapsed Catholic. He was talking about his dear bride and how when it came time to send the kids to confirmation class, she started to revisit her faith. But when it came to the part about confession and absolution, known as penance, she balked at returning to the church to confess her sins to a man before she could take communion was too much for her. 
It's good enough to put the kids through confirmation, though, because she wants them to know about the divine, to learn about being good, to love their neighbor, to think about how beautiful the divine is, how nice God is. Right, I said, and to learn about Jesus, the guy who died for our sins. He immediately changed the topic. To confess our sins to a man is too much for most of us. This man in our midst, the son of man, the prophet to the nations, Jesus by name, is a magnet, and he draws it all out, all our uncleanness, all the sins, all the demonic that is our nature. He has come to destroy us. Why do you come to church? To see your family and friends? Oh, I should hope so, but more. To sing your favorite hymns and your not-so-favorite hymns? I should hope so, but more. I should hope that you come to church to gather around the cross in that mysterious ritual we call the liturgy, to gather around the cross the magnet, Jesus drawing our sins straight into his own body, there's going to be a reaction. There's going to be shouting and hollering and tears and anger and irritation and rejoicing and hoping and getting up and moving around, but there won't be no reaction to the Word of God. It's too painful a thing that God should send His Son to die for us, and we just think on how nice it all is. Oh, I have a purpose in life. He has come to pluck us up and throw us down. He has come to destroy us and overthrow us. And if you're willing to go through that, it won't hurt in the least little bit. Not any more than it hurt that man in church that one day. Big Jimbo, or whatever his name was, the man who had a demon right there in church. The demon didn't harm him. It won't hurt any more than when Jesus rebuked the fever and sent it away. She stood up and felt good enough right there to get dinner ready. Huh. If you're willing to go through plucking up and throwing down and destroying and overthrowing, then you're in good shape for the next part. The work of God which after breaking you down, he builds you up. After plucking you up, God plants you. Don't you have to pluck up what is dead and rotten in your gardens before you can plant what is new and productive? And so God does to you. Do not be afraid of them, God says to Jeremiah. Jesus takes heart in these words, even after they nailed him to the cross, after we nailed him to the cross. Jesus takes heart, saying, Father, forgive them. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you. Jesus takes our sins to the grave, the fevers, the cancers, the tears, the hatred, the anger, the despair, all things demonic nailed into his body, and in the grave he leaves them all. Don't be afraid of Jesus. After all, he's only trying to destroy you. He's only trying to get you ready to rise from the dead.